It has to be that everyone who comes at that data is going to arrive at the same conclusion, no matter what different assumptions That's they're right. making. So this is, and I think Ains is, is like, so, has got an even bigger responsibility to sort of, you know, take this more carefully 100%. because. And some of the things, I mean, when it was some of the initial anomalies that Abby was writing about was the fact it doesn't have a coma. So when it was first detected, it, we couldn't see any coma or tail off it at all. Mm -hmm. But that was when it was really far out and, you know, really far out in the solar system. Um, and then it started to develop a coma. And so as soon as it had a coma and a tail, that seemed, a lot of us, a lot of astronomers were like, oh, that's going to, Abby's going to give up on this now because um, it's doing the thing that a comet does, which is have a coma and a tail. He's going to forget about that. But then instead he said, um, he wrote this on his blog, that um, actually I think this is a spaceship that's producing a shield. It's like flying off particles to try and protect it from space dust. And it just happens to like look mm. very similar to what a comet would do. So again, it's kind of like you're changing the story as you go along. Like yes. just if it's if it's a ship and it's not producing anything, then just stick with that hypothesis. And that hypothesis is now out. Like once you've got observations which undermine your hypothesis, it's rejected. But you can't keep editing the hypothesis on the fly to fit the data 100%. in real time, because then it's not, that's not science. That's just, um, that's just story weaving, right? right. So the, this is the big, aliens is like such a flexible hypothesis. Aliens can explain anything. So literally anything that happens in the universe, in this room, uh, the reason why your mom doesn't call you tomorrow or the reason why you dropped your coffee down the stairs. Yep. You could always just say, oh, aliens did that. And I can't prove you wrrong, but it doesn't make it a good hypothesis just because it can. it's too malleable and too flexible. I think you really need to see something pretty extraordinary. So if it, yeah, like I said, if it stopped, if it shined a laser Change. beam at us or something, mm -hmm. I uh, sent a radio emission at us, like, uh, you know, hey, we're here, like, here's a television signal beamed you away or something. I'd be down with it. But this, everything on this list is like very much what comets do. Yes. Maybe it's a slightly unusual thing, like extreme example of what a comet would do, but it's definitely very comet-like, everything it's doing. We know approximately how old it, it is. We know where it's coming from. We know the path it's been taking and therefore the projected path it's gonna take past yep. that. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't, like you you gave an example early on in the conversation, like, well, if it suddenly went up or down or all yeah. around, okay, you might think like something's maneuvering that, but yeah. it hasn't, there's yeah. no evidence to show it's done any of that. Right. And I can't disprove a negative. No one can. So I can't prove to anyone here who's listening, who really believes this is an alien spaceship. I can't prove to you it's not an alien spaceship mm. because you can't, you can never prove that something is not alien. I can't prove that anything in this room is not made by an right. alien, right? It's impossible to do that. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. So if you want to like have that as a personal hypothesis, you can, but unless it, unless it does something that nature just absolutely cannot do and it breaks our understanding of nature, then that's the only time that I think that the scientific community right. are going to get behind it. And look, I think what we all want, do you really want to have like a personal hypothesis that is just you? I think um, this thing is alien, or I think we all want to convince our peers, we want to convince our friends that what we saw was real, you know, that, that this was a real alien ship that you encountered. And the only way to get buy-in is to provide really compelling evidence yes. that even the, you want the evidence to be so good that even the skeptics are like, I can't, I can't fault you, man. Like, you're right. Like, there's no, you know, it's like Michael Jordan was so good that even the people that hated Michael Jordan were like, damn, he's the best. Like, right. there's just no, there's no way around that. And that's what we want in science. We want it to be like so clear and crisp that even the skeptics have to shut up because, and that's how all of science works. It's not particular to aliens. If you're going to claim you've got like a new theory of gravity or you think you've discovered a new exoplanet, it has to be that everyone who comes at that data is going to arrive at the same conclusion, no matter what different assumptions That's they're right. making. So this is, and I think aliens is, is like, so, has got an even bigger responsibility to sort of, you know, take this more carefully 100%. because we're so invested in it. hundred percent. And it's like, you can't get too excited about it. And what it seems like from what you're telling me today is that you know, in for this particular argument, a lot of the scientific community seems to be on the other side of Avi Loeb and saying like, this is probably what we're looking at. It's probably not an alien spaceship because the evidence like this is a lot of this is too chancery. I'm making up a word there, but yeah. it's not it's not like intense, like down to point forty million zeros one evidence or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, ev everything's on the 
on is is either completely exactly what a comet should do, like have a tail and a yep. comet and produce those gases, or it's comet like but like an extreme comet. Yeah. It, it's a, but yeah, if it was a Trojan horse, it, like why would it? Why wouldn't why wouldn't they do a better job if that's true? So I just I think the alien hypothesis is uh, is is in deep trouble with this object. But I do admire Avi for. Um, Pushing because this is, I mean, it's easy to, to say this and get ridiculed, right? And I think sure. Avi has been ridiculed for that. And I don't ridicule Avi for pushing the alien hypothesis um, because I do think we need um, it's easy to get too, to stuck in groupthink and get too conservative and just like ridicule anyone who tries to do something different and, right. and push the envelope. So even though I disagree with Avi that I don't think this is alien, I'm not going to like throw shit on him and say he's an idiot for saying this. I think it's um, he's he's you know pursuing his scientific ideas and I disagree with it in a respectful way. Um, but I'm not going to like personally attack him as saying like he's he's a doofus for like coming up with this Good. idea. That's yeah. how it should be. This is what science is supposed yeah. to be. We've lost sight of this in the modern era. And it's not just science. It's right. fucking every part of culture. It's like you throw mud on each other to get more clicks. And therefore, every everyone who disagrees with you is an idiot. And that doesn't get anyone anywhere. No. I've always said, you know. The greatest lie we ever perpetuated on humanity was that science and religion were competing. Yeah. They're both seeking the answer to the same thing. And then I, we, that's just been downstream to everything else, be it politics, culture, whatever it may be. We are always thinking that, you know, the other idea can't exist for us to exist or whatever. And that's not how it is. You're constantly trying to find things that one day are going to disprove every single thing that like a brilliant guy like Albert Einstein yeah, came up with. Yeah, that's yeah. the whole point, you know? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's kind of something to business. Like if you're an entrepreneur – and you start a company, your first company might fail and the second one might fail, but maybe you know, if you if you keep getting chances, you'll eventually right. figure out how it works and break through. And America's great because um, you know, it has really good like loan forgiveness and like it lets people keep trying. Whereas if you try if you start a business in France and it fails, like you're not allowed to get a loan for like 50 years of your <laughs> life, right? They just they don't want you to ever try again. Yeah. And I do kind of worry. Um, maybe Avi's wrong about this, but hey, maybe uh, he'll be right about another signal. Maybe not a comet, but something right. else in the future. And I'm worried that uh, a lot of scientists will just not pay attention to him because they're like, you've burnt your reputation, dude, with this one. I'm not, I'm not going to listen to anything you say ever again. Mm. And that's, that's also very closed-minded. Like, it, we have to... It, it's like Icarus, right? You're going to... You have to fly close to the sun to take to to really advance yes. and maybe in this case in my opinion i think the wings are melting off and he's falling but we should keep giving the dude a chance to like with uh, evidence to push the envelope yeah 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 if you bring evidence it should be evaluated yeah and if the evidence is good then you take a farther look if yeah. it's things that maybe can be refuted in good scientific mathematical ways then you go okay this isn't the one pal yeah, yeah. you know it shouldn't be that hard but when, when did you like did you grow up Wanted to be an astrophysicist? Were you just fascinated with space as a little kid? Uh, I was always fascinated with space. Yeah, I remember, I remember loving planets and the universe when I was a kid. I loved sci-fi. I loved Star Trek. Grew up, loved Star Trek growing up. Next Generation was my bag. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and Star Wars, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I thought I was going to be a physicist. When I was about sort of 12, 13, I was getting really interested in physics and I had a great high school teacher, Mr. Fox, and he gave me a load of physics books on the side. I was like, you should check this out. And I was reading it, I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. Like there's neutrinos passing through my brain right now. There's like all oh, these particles everywhere. It kind of it was like an enlightenment. Like mm. when you realize the world's so much more complicated than you think. Um, so I studied physics at college. And then when I was at college, I started to come back to space because I got the impression, for right or maybe it's pretty wrong. I think it is partially wrong, but that to make progress in physics was was getting really hard. That you needed like billions and billions of dollars to you know have these huge teams of thousands of people, and you were just going to be one very small cog in that machine. Whereas in astronomy, there's a hundred billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, mm. and there's only eight billion people on Earth. So. Each of us can have a hundred stars to ourselves, more than that, right? It's just unreal. you can have just a hundred stars that you yourself could study your whole life and everyone else can have their own hundred stars. We could all move there and have our this is my hundred star system that I, I live on. And each of those would have about ten planets and you know, you could have a thousand planets to yourself, right? So that's, crazy. that's that's just how ridiculous the scale of the universe is. And I realized we are never gonna like get bored of this we're never going to run out of stuff to discover because we only know of a percent of a percent of a percent of what's out there 
and in physics, it, it kind of, I'm sure there's a vast amount we don't know about as well, but it felt to me like all the rapid progress and discovery was happening in, in the universe, yeah. Mm. So you start to take that journey through school itself and then you get into that and eventually like, and you've mentioned this term several times today, I think you started to explain it once, but you developed a specialty in identifying exoplanets yeah. and, and observing them. Yeah. So for people out there that just want to understand what that is as a recap, what is an exoplanet? Yeah, it's just a planet that orbits another star. That's what it means. So exo means outside. Mm -hmm. So extrasolar is, to, is the full name, but we just shortened it to exoplanets. Um, so we know of about 5,000 to 6,000 exoplanets, I believe at the time of writing, um, which is obviously a lot. We've only discovered those in the last 20 years. Uh, 5,000 to 6,000. About six, I think about 6,000 confirmed planets now, okay. yeah. Um, and the uh, the discovery started about 20, 25 years ago. And there's been a, you know, a rapid explosion in discovery over that time. And yeah, I was in college when the first ones were being discovered. And uh, to me, as a young person, this was like, this is, it's like the gold rush in San Francisco, right? Everyone, you know, as a young person, yeah. you're like, this is where all the shit's happening. I want to get over there and pick up some gold for myself. And I've discovered myself, like probably a dozen planets or something in my career. I don't even count them, but yeah, I've just I've found a fair few planets myself <laughs> in my career, which is kind of wild to think about. You know, how, oh, yeah, do you how do you find one? So the way I, there's a few different ways. The way I normally use is called the transit method, okay. which is to look for eclipses, basically. So these planets are so far away, you know, thousands of light years away sometimes, that you can't possibly take a photo of them. They're just, at that distance, the star and the planet are just a blob of light. Right. You can't possibly see them. But if the orbital inclination is correct, it will sometimes eclipse in front of the star. The same reason why we had like the, you know, when the moon eclipsed the sun, because that solar eclipse, mm -hmm. um, maybe you saw those two great American eclipses we had fairly recently in the US, which is awesome to see. Stare right at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, well, you want the glasses, but yeah, be careful with that. So yeah, I really enjoyed watching those. And it's the same thing. You can also see transits of Venus. Uh, Venus sometimes uh, goes in front of the sun. And you can catch that. You probably need a telescope or a good pair of binoculars to catch those, but those are fun to watch. Um, and so in the same sense, some of these exoplanets will serendipitously pass in front of their star. Mm. And as they do, the star gets dimmer, right? Because some of the light is being blocked out. So that's what we look for. We just look for these like stars that are winking at us, basically, just getting like a little bit dimmer and then they get back to normal. And we notice that every 10 days that happens. And so if it happens every 10 days, that means the planet is on an orbital period of 10 days around its star. So that's its year. And you can identify that that's a planet versus you know, some sort of like loose piece in space or something like that strictly because of the size. Yeah, well, you know, it's an orbiting object if it repeats. Um, the the size of it basically tells you, yes, yeah, so a lot of the objects we detect are typically like, you know, between the size of Neptune and Jupiter. So that's not debris. Obviously, if it's the size of Neptune, that's, that's a pretty big object. Um, yeah, if you make the planet twice as big, it blocks out four times the amount of light. So um, that means big planets are really easy to find, but small planets are really hard to yeah. find. And the smallest planets we can currently detect are about the size of mm, the moon at best, but typically the Earth. Mm. So we can find Earth-sized planets. Um, there's a really beautiful star system called TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1? Yeah, that I recommend everyone Google at some point. It has It's the most famous exoplanet system at this point. It has seven planets. They're all earth size. Three of them in the habitable zone of the star. In the ha meaning like you could, could actually have... land on them and you're not frying to death or freezing well, to death. Well, the habitable zone here just means that um, the temperature is similar to the earth, basically. Wow. Yeah, so they had the right distance for life. This um, is it, TRAPPIST-1? Yeah, and this is most astronomers' favorite exoplanet system. Uh, the seven, uh, it's a really dim star. The star is about eight times less massive than the sun. And so it's a really diminutive star. It's very red because it's so cool. And so the planets are actually packed in really close in. I think mm. all seven planets are closer in than Mercury is around the sun, all seven of them. So, you know, like the, they're kind of the same sort of distance that the moon is from us. So if there's an alien civilization here, they could like hop from planet to planet, like no problem, be super easy. If I even like, um, if there was life on one of these planets, it would almost certainly just spread out between the planets by rocks just being knocked off from between them. Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.